earlier this week, someone at uh, St. Mark's was talking to me about their daily Bible notes and that that morning's reading and reflection had all been about the second coming. And we were talking about the fact that we don't often preach or think about this anymore. Well, Robin, in today's reading, and in fact in this kingdom season, we can and we will talk about the second coming. Are you ready? Not for this sermon, but are you ready for when Christ comes again? to collect his own. All three of our readings this morning, and in fact every morning if you follow the lectionary for morning prayer, are warnings of what is about to come. And the fact that if our names are not in the book, we're not getting in. Strong stuff. Is it worth just hoping that we get in? Or do we actually intentionally have to make sure that we get in. There is a fine line, I think, between hope and naivety, just as there is a fine line between reality and pessimism. As a result, the strength of our hope needs to be tested by proper engagement in reality, so that our yearnings for a better order lead to challenge and action, the triumph of hope over experience. The famous motto of the BBC reads, Nation shall speak peace unto nation. It's peculiar to the BBC, but it clearly it is inspired by the Old Testament, the book of Micah and the book of Zechariah. We envisage where we envisage a better world order when the Saviour will come and transfigure the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of God and of his Christ. And yet the BBC, whose mottos imagines that kingdom come, is currently not reporting the devastating retaliatory attacks between Israel and Palestine, not far from those very stones which Jesus' disciples behold when they express their wonder to him, look, teacher, what large stones and large buildings. The wailing associated with that western wall, which is the only bit left of those stones, is not the preserve of any one group of people, but must be a wailing shared by all of us if we are to avoid the danger of naivety and challenge the danger of pessimism. It is at best bewildering bewildering and at most frightening, if you think about it, that Jesus, who is the fulfilment of the Old Testament prophecy that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and that the the Messiah will speak peace to all nations, then tells his disciples that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. What are we to make of that extraordinary scene in this morning's gospel lesson? Jesus seems to be saying that all of this is necessary, but the beginning of the birth pangs, as he puts it. Does that mean that what's happening in Israel and Palestine right this minute, or in fact in the Yemen or in Syria, is somehow inevitable and that we should resign ourselves to it? Or is there something quite profoundly challenging in what Jesus predicts? Not that nation rising against nation in itself is inevitable, but that the consequence of our failure to recognise that God makes righteousness and praise blossom before all nations, not only before one nation, and certainly not just my nation. The current situation in Gaza, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, is by no means straightforward, or (coughs) nor can blame be attributed wholly to one side or the other, nor is it as simple as there are two sides. Like everything, it is religious and political historical and contemporary, geographical and financial, opportunistic and strategic, and it's very real, and it's very man-made. It is where experience has been allowed to triumph over hope. When Jesus looks at the temple and says not one stone will be left upon another and that it will all be thrown down, he is not making some great dramatic prophecy discerned 
through some great divine insight. He's merely reflecting on the nature of human folly. Because any shrewd political observer of the time would have seen the way things were going and said exactly the same thing. And indeed, the temple was destroyed some 40 years later in the First Jewish-Roman War. A distant echo, perhaps, of the mortar attacks of recent days, but by no means unrelated. This is the season immediately before Advent, when we begin to turn our thoughts to the end of time, to our death, and to a time when we will stand in the presence of God. We consider particularly themes to do with judgment and therefore to do with sin. And we have, it seems to me, a very narrow view of both of these things. There are three sins, I think, which we are all, of which we are all guilty, which relate to what Jesus is saying in this morning's gospel and to the situations in the Israel, Palestine, Yemen, Syria, Sadly, countless other places, including our own country, as we suffer yet more Brexit fiascos. And they stand quite far apart from the traditional vices with which religious people have had an unhealthy obsession. The first is tribalism and our desire to build walls around ourselves, to shut out reality, to shut out others, to shut out difference and create romantic cocoons which are mean and false. At best, we can call it tribalism. At worst, we can call it ethnic cleansing. The second is arrogance and that extraordinary habit of, at which religious people excel, making God dependent on us rather than us dependent on God. It is where we judge on God's behalf, judge others. And rather than demonstrating religious zeal, it merely betrays lack of faith. The third is blame, where we fail to understand on a worrying regular basis that we are all jointly responsible for everything that happens in this life. The intricate connectedness of everything makes it impossible ever to act to attribute fault to one person and to no one else. Jesus on the cross understood this, which is why he opened wide his arms for us all. When God spoke his last and final word about everything and took the blame on himself. The cross was the triumph of God over tribalism, over arrogance and blame. It is the triumph of hope over experience and we must never forget that when we hear of mortar attacks or when we sit in our armchairs criticising. So I'm going to finish with a few lines from the readings that we heard earlier from the Bible because there is nothing better. The Bible says it all. So a few lines from Daniel. Then there will be time of troubles the worst since nations first came into existence. And when that time comes, all the people whose names are written in God's book will be saved. And from Hebrews. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess, because we can trust God to keep his promise. Let us be concerned for one another, to help one another, to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, since you see that the day of the Lord is coming near. Amen. <laughs>